to Podcasts On Demand, a continuing medical education activity. This activity includes the most recent and current clinical data presented by leading experts. If you are seeking continuing education credit, please review the disclosures and the requirements for a successful completion of the activity prior to listening to the podcast. A link is found in the podcast description that can direct you to this information. Hi, this is Dr. Paul Sachs, uh, Clinical Director of the Division of Infectious Diseases at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Professor of Medicine at Hartford Medical School. And welcome to Clinical Clips from the 2024 Munich AIDS Conference. Today's day three of four. And happy birthday, happy 90th birthday to my mother, if she happens to be interested in getting the latest news from Munich. So there was an interesting afternoon session today on uh, new antiretroviral agents. And I'm going to start with a, a clinical trial, a phase two clinical trial called Artistry 1, which basically is looking at the combination of Bictegravir and Lenacapavir. And this combination in this study was given as separate pills. Actually, the Lenacapavir was given in two different doses. And the big tag are very interesting. It was given as a 75 milligram dose, which gives comparable exposure to 50 milligrams when it's combined with TAF-50C, which is how we usually give it. And the study population of interest were people taking complex antiretroviral regimens, which is variously defined in the protocol. But just to give you an idea of the kind of regimens they were taking, uh, this is an older patient population who'd been on an ART for many years. Most of them had some degree of background resistance. That's why they were taking a complex regimen. 27 years median of treatment. That's like a world record. Lots of comorbidities. And interestingly, if you looked at the number of pills they took, uh, over a quarter of them were taking five or more pills a day. So the goal was to see if they could simplify their regimen to just big Tegravir, Lenacapavir, two different doses, and they compared that to continuing the background regimen. And 48-week results were discussed, and the 48-week results showed that a little over 90% of those in the uh, in the big Tegavir lenacapavir arms uh, maintained suppression versus 100% in the background regimen, uh, in the baseline regimen strategy. And this is not statistically significant, but remember, it's a, a phase two study, and the sample size was small. Uh, since the regimen was well tolerated, uh, there are plans now to go forward with a co-formulated version of the Bictegravir lenacapavir combination, 75 milligrams Bictegravir, 50 milligrams of uh, lenacapavir, once daily orally, and that is uh, a fully powered study and look forward to seeing the results of that uh, in the future. Uh, the second study is actually a much earlier kind of trial. This is earlier in development. And it's a, uh, a integrase inhibitor called VH184, which the uh, presenter described as the next generation integrase inhibitor, third generation integrase inhibitor. And whenever someone mentions these generations, I always think of cephalosporins. But what they really mean uh, here is, is, is uh, resistance, is that they have activity against integrase inhibitor resistant viruses. So the first phase was of the study uh, presented was just, you know, first in humans, demonstrating that it seems to be well tolerated. Uh, these are in people who are HIV negative. And also they did some probes for drug interactions and didn't seem to find any CYP3A4 interactions using midazolam. In addition, they gave it with and without food and found it had a, a moderate food effect, which in general doesn't require taking it with or without food. So that's good news. But probably the more interesting part uh, for those of us who sort of uh, nerd out on this resistance stuff is that they took uh, clinical isolates from the dawning and the sailing studies. Uh, those were studies looking at um, dolotegravir and raltegravir respectively in treatment experience patients. And in patients who were in those studies who developed resistance to the integrase inhibitors, they then tested this new VH184 in vitro against these isolates. And they found that it maintained very potent activity across a wide range of highly resistant viruses. And why is that important? Well, it's important because um, as we know, with more and more dolotegravir being used globally, there is an increased incidence of integrase inhibitor resistance. It's inevitable over 20 million people on dolotegravir is going to be more resistance, and it's good to have something like this uh, under investigation. 
The third study I wanted to discuss is uh, not really new drugs at all, but it's a new population. And that's the first uh, study that looks at injectable cabotegravir in adolescents. Uh, this is a, a combination that, of course, has been approved in, in adults, but it doesn't have enough data in adolescents for approval. But it's a population that's very important because they often struggle with poor adherence and stigma and all the other things that often drive people to want injectable therapy. And this is a, a global study. Uh, they are at 18 uh, impact, that's the name of the trials network, sites around the globe in practically every continent uh, except Australia and, and Antarctica. And what they did was they, they took the cabotegravir ropivirine in virologically suppressed adolescents. There are 144 of them, median age of 15, over 90% had uh, con perinatal HIV infection. So they've been taking oral ART for a long time their whole life, essentially. And then uh, they gave them injectable cabotegravir or piverine at standard doses after an oral lead-in, and it was overall highly successful. Uh, it ended up leading to high rates of virologic suppression. And um, not only that, importantly, every participant was asked, do you want to go back on oral therapy or do you want to continue the injectable? And, and everyone chose uh, continuing uh, the injectable. So this is a population that's really understudied. So I hope that they can gain access to this treatment in the future, especially in countries in uh, parts of the world like Sub-Saharan Africa, where most of the pediatric HIV is now occurring. Switching now to a more uh, regular um, HIV treatment, not new treatment, and that's dolotegravir-lamivudine versus bictegravir FTC taf This is the first of two such studies at this conference. This is called the DIAD study, and it's important because it's our two most commonly used regimens. Patients who are stable on Bictegravir FTC TAF um, were then randomized to uh, continue it or to switch to Dolotegravir lamivudine in a two to one ratio. And, and the week 48 results were presented. And just to cut to the chase, uh, virologic suppression was, was similar in both of them. Um, there were more discontinuations in the Dolotegravir lamivudine arm, but that could be because of the open label nature of the study and something called ascertainment bias, which is that when people are switched to a new regimen, they often blame any side effect on that new regimen. Um, obviously, they excluded people who had chronic hepatitis B or had any NRTI resistance. That would be an interesting future study. And, and they did find that there was little difference in metabolic parameters. There was slightly uh, more weight reduction in the dolotegravir-lamivudine arm, but it was not statistically significant. But stay tuned for tomorrow's discussion about the Paso Doble study. And the last thing I wanted to mention was just a fascinating report from India uh, on a topic that comes up uh, periodically in our clinics, only the numbers here are quite large. Um, and that's the study, uh, that's a, a longitudinal study of HIV elite controllers, people, virologic controllers who maintain viral suppression without any ART. And this looked from 2001 to 2023 in Mumbai. And out of 4,030 treatment naive people uh, in, in that clinic population, ultimately they found 36 HIV uh, controllers um, who had at least five years of follow-up. And I think the demographics are very interesting. Um, first, there was a, an interesting high proportion who had HIV-2 also. Uh, four out of the group had HIV-2 co-infection. In addition, there were more women than men, 78% uh, women, 22% uh, men. Um, also interesting is that a bunch of them had vertical HIV acquisition, meaning they got it at the time of birth. Um, uh, there were some who did have to go on ART during the course of the follow-up, uh, two for pregnancy, uh, one for viremia, they lost virologic control, uh, one for uh, a person who developed an immune-mediated complication, that's ITP, and then one who developed pulmonary tuberculosis, although given the high incidence of pulmonary TB in India, it could be not HIV-related. It's just a fascinating observation and showing that in this context where we don't always know if ART is required, uh, long-term follow-up can give us some very important information. So uh, that comes to the end of today's uh, clinical clips. Uh, please go to the landing page for slides and to claim your continuing education credit. Uh, please be sure to come back tomorrow for our final clip from the AIDS 2024 conference here in Munich. And once again, uh, happy birthday, mom. We hope you found this podcast useful and educational. 
To receive continuing education credit and to download your printable certificate, please go to the activity page at practice.cme.com to complete the post-test and evaluation to receive continuing education credit.